Hey there, my name is Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. So the Raspberry Pi Pico is an amazing microcontroller board. In fact, it is now my preferred microcontroller board. I have a video here on this channel comparing the Arduino ecosystem to the Raspberry Pi ecosystem, and I tell you why I think it is a great microcontroller board. Now, it's so powerful that with a few resistors, it can actually be used to generate a VGA signal, not just a VGA signal, but an entire VGA image. In fact, some clever folks have even gone as far as to port Doom directly on to the Raspberry Pi Pico, and the Pico is also the video card generating the VGA signal. So in this video, I wanna look at what is VGA, how does it work, and how you build a digital to analog converter with just a few resistors for the Raspberry Pi Pico so that it can generate a VGA signal. So if you wanna find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so if we want the Pico to generate a VGA signal, we first need to understand what is a VGA signal. So you've probably seen these cables here, these 15-pin connectors that you connect from the back of a PC, for example, into a monitor. And these are pretty common. I've got a box of them of just spare ones that I've kind of collected over the years. So what is VGA? The Video Graphics Array, VGA is a de facto PC graphic standard that was first introduced with the IBM PS2 line of computers in 1987. So we're talking about something from 1987, so a few years ago. But the point is it has become the de facto standard. It's the lowest common denominator that virtually all post-1990 PC graphics hardware can be expected to implement. So even if you take a graphics card today that has a VGA output on it, of course, it will uh, generate a VGA signal uh, at its lowest common denominator, 640 by 480, and you will get a picture. And often when you boot up your PC, of course, you might see the BIOS screen booting up and it has to pick a, a resolution for those at the very, very beginning. And often you'll find that's kind of VGA or the remnants of VGA, even if we're now dealing with HDMI or DisplayPort or whatever. So 1987, the 1990s, of course, we're talking about uh, CRT monitors, we're not talking about flat screen monitors. And the point is, is that uh, with an analog uh, cathode ray tube, basically there's a gun in the back of the cathode ray tube that fires electrons at the phosphorus screen. And the beam sweeps back and forth. So it starts in the top left-hand corner and it starts firing at the, the display, at the display, at the glass at the front end. Uh, and it uses a sync signal. So when it gets to the end of the line, it goes across here. Da, 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 da. When it gets to the end of the line, there's a sync signal. And it keeps doing that. And then when it gets to the bottom of the screen, there's a sync signal, which sends the beam back up here to the top. And it starts going across again. So it's all about firing uh, data and at, at the screen at the right time, according to these two sync signals. One at the end of the line and one at the end of the display at the end of the page, uh, okay? And uh, it's all analog. Now, of course, we're now dealing with a Raspberry Pi Pico. Everything is, is digital. So how does this work? Well, this is what we're gonna look at. So let's just have a look at those uh, 15 pins. And really, if you look at it, there's one pin for blue, one pin for green, and one pin for red. And then the rest of the stuff is either these sync signals, sync signals, vertical sync, horizontal sync, and the rest is all ground. And if you look at the list here, you've got the red, green, blue, and you've got lots of ground going on. Okay, another ground there. And then there's some stuff here to do with communication between the monitor and the video card to do some kind of identification and other stuff, but you don't need those, they're, they're optional. You don't actually need them. Like here, monitor ID bit, optional, okay? You don't actually need it. So you can just produce a signal if you have red, green, blue, and the two sync signals and the ground, of course. That's all you need to generate a valid VGA signal. Now, timing is everything because that cathode ray tube, when it's swinging back and forth, it doesn't wait for you to send the data. It doesn't say, oh, well, if you could just get around to wait, I'll move on to the next section, the next line uh, when you've got a moment. It says, no, whatever is there on the pins at this moment, that's the color that I'm gonna fire up the display and it doesn't wait. So you've got to get the timing absolutely right. And of course, here's a picture from data. There's that joke, of course, in one of the episodes where he goes, you know, turn to tell a joke and he goes, but my timing uh, is digital. So let's try to understand this in terms of numbers. Now, this is a bit dense, but if you follow through, I think it's easy enough to understand. So basically, this bit in the middle here is a, is a timing diagram, and this bit in the middle is the bit where things are actually displayed on the screen. Now, the way it works is before the beam sweeping across like this, sweeping across like this, and before it starts a line, there's a little delay. 
let us so that everything can get ready everything can get set up let's start the pixels a little delay and also the, um, the beam will have swung back to this point so it needs to stabilize okay and then it goes across and at this point when it crosses this threshold here you take right give me the numbers do, 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 and it starts giving you all the pixels that are appearing on those three pins red green and blue until it gets to the end of the line and then it goes right now there's a delay here of just nothing else is going on. And then we hit the sync signal. So after the last pixel, there's a delay. Then the sync signal that causes the line, the pixel the gun, the ray gun to go back to the beginning. And then it starts the whole thing again. And it keeps doing this until it gets down to the bottom. And then we've got the same idea. You've got a front porch and a back porch. That's what these uh, delays are called at the beginning and the end. And then you've got another sync. So it goes back up to the top left-hand corner here, goes through this front porch delay then finally starts again. So basically, if you know the length of this delay, and you know the length of this delay, and you know the length of this delay, and you know when you hit a sync signal, you wait this much, and then you start firing off your pixels. So it all just comes down to timing. So here is an example of some timings. So if you've got a 640 by 480 display, okay, then the pixel clock is running at 25.175 megahertz, which means that each pixel is 40 nanoseconds. So after 40 nanoseconds, you need to change the color on the red, green, and blue to be the next one. And you just keep doing that. And then you know how long a whole um, timing is for the line. You know how long it is for a whole frame. And then if you add in here some numbers with the front porch and the back porch, say, well, this is 16 pixels long is the front porch, and you can work out 16 times 40 nanoseconds. This is 96 seconds um, pixels long. This is 48 pixels long. And basically, there are just pages and pages of these charts that you can get that just tell you all about the different resolutions and their front porch and their back porch and the pixel clock and, and all that kind of stuff. Now, thankfully, the Pico Raspberry Pi Foundation have built some libraries. We've got a lot of that data built into it. So we've actually got at our fingertips all that data. And all we've got to be able to do is convince the Pixel, the Pico, sorry, to uh, produce numbers according to this timing chart. Now, of course, it's very easy for the Pico to do some timing. It's a digital uh, little box and it's running at a pretty high speed. So it's actually, each pixel is produced every frame the display at the display frame rate. The RP24, that's the chip inside the Pico, is powerful enough to generate the pixels at this rate. So basically the Pico is fast enough to generate these numbers faster than the beam can sweep across the display. So that's really, really good, which means we can use it to, to power a VGA display. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's actually pretty easy. Here's that picture of the uh, connector that I showed you with the three colors and the sinks. And actually you can connect five pins to the red, five pins to the green, five pins to the blue, and then one pin for each of the sinks. So if you set this pin high, it will do a sync. You'd leave it up there for however a nanosecond is written in the specification, then you drop it down again, and then the VGA will say, oh, this is, this is the signal. This is what I understand. They are getting these sync signals. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but the important thing is here is that you've got all of these resistors connected to these five pins, and they are doubling every time. So you start with 500 ohms, then 1,000 ohms, and then 2,000 ohms, and 4,000 ohms, and 8,000 ohms. Okay, so it's doubling every time, which means if you put a voltage on here, you'll, it'll go through a 500 resistor, and then you'll get an analog value out of here. If you put it through this one, you'll get a different analog value. So now you've got two levels of green. And if you put it this one, a different one, a different one, so you actually, you could think there's five levels of green, but in fact, if you wanted one, something between this one and this one, you could do one and a half. So you power up both this pin and this pin, and now you'll get the current going through there. And there are some calculations, Ohm's law and all that circuit stuff that we can work out. We'll have a quick look at that in a minute to tell you the different rating, the different voltages you'll get appearing here on this signal. Now, if you can flick these pins on and off for each three colors at the same speed as the monitor is sweeping back and forth according to those sync timings, you're going to get a picture uh, on the display. And that's what the Pico does. It basically turns on off these 15 pins. So we're looking at 15 bit color, 16 bit color, you know, in one sense, but we're doing one bit uh, missing, 15 bit color, okay, uh, for red, green, blue, and you basically power those on and off really, really fast to make each pixel light up on the display. And the Pico can do it. It's fast enough to do it. So there are three color channels on a VJ connector, and they need to be an analog signal. As I said, it's not just one or zero. It's got, it's got the voltage level there matters. And in fact, it's got to be between zero and 0 0.7 volts. That's the uh, the important thing. So therefore, we need to connect the digital outputs of 3.3 volts to that analog signal. Now, you can create a simple DAC, digital to audio uh, analog converter, using a group of resistors connected directly to the outputs, as I displayed here. And this is just a picture of the red one. Okay, the values of resistors are weighted to give different amounts of significance, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, 16, as I just described. 
Each channel is connected to five resistors, 500 ohms and so on as I've described. This means that the GPO bits can contribute twice as much current through its resistor than the previous bit. Okay, so we know that. Now here's some basic circuit theory to tell you. If you've got um, resistors in parallel, this is how you work out the value. So it's one over 500 plus one over 1000 plus one over 2000, blah, blah, blah. that gives you a value of 0 0.00388. So if uh, you then do one over that, you basically got a combined total of 258 uh, ohms. And the monitor is connected to the signal via a 75 ohm resistor to the ground. So the way VGA is designed, there is 75 ohms on the monitor side, and that creates what they call a potential divider. So using a potential divider, and now you can do the maths here, we can basically, if we've got 258 ohms, and you do the maths, 3.3 volts, blah, 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 you actually get up 0.74 volts, which is close enough to our 0.7 volts that we wanted. So now we have a way of producing a signal from zero through to 0.74 volts, depending on which pins we turn on, which will then depend on the intensity of the red or the green or the blue for that particular pixel as it flies past in that 40 nanosecond gap that we've got to, to power that one, uh, one pixel. Now in the Raspberry Pi documentation, they do actually show the design for how you can actually connect up a small board, which has got uh, things in it for VGA, for SD card and for audio stuff. And it's this demo board and they give you all of the design inside at the Raspberry Pi and they've done all the work. They just didn't make it, but they give you all the work. And here's their 3D renderings of that very board. And as you can see here, there's a VGA uh, connector. And this down here, if you look very, very carefully, that's a set of resistors. These are all resistors going down the side here, connected to all those pins that we were just mentioning a few moments ago. And actually, of course, some people in the Raspberry community, uh, this is uh, Pi Moroni, I think, went out and said, well, let's build it then. Well, if we've got all the designs, let's build it. So this is the board I've got hold of. It's very, very easy to test because you just pop in your Pico here. Here you can see all the resistors going down here that we were talking about. Okay, and you pop it in there and it's already connected up to the VGA. There's also stuff for SD card and for the audio. If you're interested in those, let me know, because maybe it'd be good to do, let's say, an SD card uh, reading video, because that would be quite interesting uh, to, to do. And there's a few buttons on here as well that you can use, and it's got its own power supply uh, if need be. So there we go. I've got hold of one of those boards, and that's what I connect up to my, uh, to my VGA monitor. Now, the Raspberry Pi people have published a whole load of stuff in the Pico Playground about how you can get this to work. And here is there's a video, this do, uh, folder called Scan Video, and that's where they've got all the examples, which we'll have a look at. So here is some of the examples. There's one that just bounces a Raspberry Pi thing across the screen. This one shows uh, a 640 by 480 image uh, in uh, 60 frames per second. There's some ones here to do with uh, tiling and sprites and so on. There's a Mandelbrot program. This is a very basic scan line uh, thing that just changes the different colors to show all the different colors that are available. They're all available, uh, available, and you can compile them and then run them and use the ideas in there for how you'd want to further develop this for your own purposes. Now, the one thing to note about this is that when you're dealing with this, because you're creating these pixels in real time, at the moment that, that gun in the cathode ray tube is going past that pixel, that's when you need to present the right values of the RGB. It's done on a scan line. So basically you can prepare a scan line, that's one line, before you get to the next sync signal, you can prepare it and then the code that they've written uses the PIO, and I've got a video here about PIOs on this channel if you're interested in the programmable IO, if you're interested in about that, how it works. They use the PIO to make sure they get pushed out at the right time according to hardware timing. It doesn't matter what the CPU is doing, PIO is hardware based timing, it will just, it will bash out those bits at the right interval. And then in the meantime, the CPU can go around and create the next line ready to go. And then you can have several lines prepared, but not a whole frame. It's not a frame buffer, it's scan line. This is basically the code that you do. You begin a scan line. You can work out, there's some functions here to work out what line you're on, what frame you're on. And then once you've packed it all in, you then just say end of uh, buffer. And then that's ready, that gets sent off into the queue to the PIOs to get to get uh, bashed out on those pins according to the timing uh, by the PIO, which makes it hardware done. Now, why not frame buffer? We'll just think even a 320 by 240 
uh, 16-bit color is 153k and the peak has only got 264k so if you went bigger than that 640 where well, you've already run out of memory as you can see so uh, that's why they've opted for this scan line idea because that way you don't have to uh, keep a frame uh, buffer hanging around in memory which will just take up too much memory and the way they do it is that as you create each scan line you can basically it's encoded in one of four ways you can say here's a single pixel and then you can give it the 16-bit 15-bit really color that you want for the uh, for the pixel. You can save some space in memory by saying, "Well, here are two pixels of the or, uh, two pixels." You can say, "Here are three or more pixels," or you can have a color run that says, "The next X pixels are all black. The next seven pixels are all black, or the next seven pixels are all are all green." And that's how you actually do the coding here inside this scan line. You fill it up saying, "This pixel, this pixel," and you do it for one line of the scan, and you fill them all up uh, in there, and then that produces through the PIO, the PIO interprets that so that it can then uh, bash it out onto the signals that we've seen. Now, you may think that's not very uh, convenient, but someone, really clever fellow, has actually managed to take a Raspberry Pi Pico and, and port Doom to it using this scanline system. So that actually works. I'll give you a link to the video uh, below in the descriptions. That actually works and you can actually produce uh, fast enough to produce uh, a Doom on your Raspberry Pi Pixel when it's also not only is it doing the CPU stuff, it's also the, the video card. So that's pretty amazing. So what's missing? Well, we've got all the scan line stuff. It's all there and the way they've, it's all documented, very, very good stuff. However, something higher level is really needed to make it easy for, you know, uh, uh, novice programmers, learner programmers who are just getting into this. Something a bit higher level would be nice for them to use. Maybe something that then it extracts things like uh, sprites and so on at a higher level. So you could actually just say, please put this sprite here. And again, if you wanted to build a user interface in the UI library would be nice. Now there are different things on the internet. You can go around, people have started to write different libraries and I've looked into a few of them. Uh, but what I'm saying is you need official, official ones or at least officially recognized one so that we so that they're there for everybody just to use. And the other thing is it all has to be done in C or C++ and really some micro python support would be great as well. So that's what's missing if you if you want it to be more than just real nerdy looking at how VGA works and how you can produce scan lines before the sync signal in so many nanoseconds then we're going to need some higher level uh, frameworks. Uh, but if you enter that stuff, if you want to, and that guy that did the Doom port, he was quite happy to do that, then it's there for you to go and look at and uh, go and create some, some images, go and create some stuff uh, by actually powering the VGA at the speed that you want it to. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Sims. I really hope you enjoyed this look at VGA and the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, I've got hold of one of those boards, as I showed you. Not very expensive. Worth getting hold of one just to experiment with and to really understand how VGA works. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you like these kinds of videos, please do consider to stick around by subscribing to the channel. Also, don't forget you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains, and I also have a monthly newsletter. Go to GaryExplains.com, type in the email address, no spam, but you will get the email. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.